Today we're going to talk about the chemistry of water and so we're going to be discussing the structure of water and its properties and also pH. First of all, water is an incredibly important part of any organism, including us as humans. It makes up about 60% of our weight and it's used in many different processes in the bodies, as you can see listed down the side, like carrying nutrients, different metabolic reactions, etc. And a lot of our organs are made up of a certain amount or content of water. So it is vital for life. So first, let's take a look at its molecular structure. So water is H2O. It's made out of two hydrogens and one oxygen. And you have this on your paper so you could fill it in as we go. So the oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons and eight electrons, two in the first shell and six in the second. And then hydrogens only have one proton and one electron. And you could see that to get a full valence shell, they have to actually share electrons and that will give hydrogen a full valent shell at two and oxygen a full valent shell at eight. And because they're sharing these electrons here and here, that is called a polar covalent bond. And when you have a polar covalent bond, if you remember from our previous video, a polar covalent bond means that atoms are sharing electrons unequally. That one of the, one of the atoms has a greater tug or pull called electronegativity that's pulling the electrons more forcefully towards its end. And because electrons are negative, that side of the molecule is going to have a slightly negative charge, whereas the closest thing to the other ends are the protons, which are positive. So th the hydrogen ends have a slightly positive end. So we say that water is a polar molecule because of this. It's slightly charged on both ends. Water could also be shown in a few different ways, and you can look at the pictures over here. So this is uh, the, I guess, the uh, atomic structure showing all the protons, neutrons, and electrons that I had you draw in this picture. But it could be drawn like this in this three-dimensional model or a what's called a structural formula, or it's sometimes called a ball and stick model, too. So you'll see water drawn differently at, in different pictures, different places. Because water is polar, it's able to form hydrogen bonds. If you remember from when we were talking about bonding in the last video, a hydrogen bond is when the, the slightly positive hydrogen of one molecule is attracted to the negative part of another molecule. So hydrogen bonds happen between molecules, not between atoms. And so we know that the hydrogens are slightly positive because water's polar, and the oxygens are slightly negative because water's polar. When two water molecules come in close proximity to each other, the slight negative oxygen and the slight positive hydrogen are attracted to each other. Opposites attract. And that attraction is called a hydrogen bond. And water could do this quite easily, in fact, and make tons and tons and tons of hydrogen bonds. And because of this hydrogen bonding, water has some pretty cool properties. The first property is when water hydrogen bonds to itself. So water hydrogen bonding or attracting to other water molecules, as we just saw in the previous picture. This is called cohesion. And it creates this force that we know as surface tension. And so these are some examples of cohesion where water's hydrogen bonding to itself. You may have done this in a previous science class where you see how many drops of water could go on the surface, the top of a penny. And it's something like 43, 45 drops, way more than you ever think. And that's because as the drops are accumulating, more and more hydrogen bonds are forming. And right along the surface, those hydrogen bonds between those water molecules, they create this force that we know as surface tension. Because they literally hang and tug onto each other, which prevents them from spilling over the edge. So this is showing the hydrogen bond or cohesive force between the two water molecules. And you'll see that on things like leaves that have a waxy cuticle or even your wax car, that these droplets of water kind of bubble together. And that's because of hydrogen bonding or cohesion, surface tension. You could sometimes have very dense objects that are more dense in water, like a paper clip or even an insect. It seems like they're floating on the surface of water, but in fact, they're more dense and they should sink. But because of all the hydrogen bonds on the surface of the water, it creates surface tension. And you could actually 
kind of gently place these things on the top and as long as you don't disrupt the surface tension or the hydrogen bonds, it will hold that object on the surface. This is a really cool picture showing surface tension or a cohesive force. As a swimmer is trying to break out of the water for a breath, you can see the skim of water over her head and that's showing great surface tension. So the hydrogen bonds are not broken yet, which is why you see it so smooth like that. That's pretty amazing. It's a cool picture. Another property is when water could hydrogen bond to something that's not water and we call this adhesion. So water attracting other molecules or hydrogen bonding to other molecules that are not water. And one of the forces or things that it creates is called capillary action. And you might have experienced these in a bunch of different ways. So first of all, if you've ever poured a liquid out of a glass and you're trying to be really careful and in being really careful, it kind of dribbles down the side and you're like, oh man, that's because the water is hydrogen bonding to the polar glass or plastic that it's coming out of. And so it's literally kind of sticking to it, which is why it's dribbling down the side. Over here, you've hopefully been exposed to what a meniscus is in science class. So when we're using something like a graduated cylinder and it creates this dip or meniscus, that is because the water molecules are adhering to the side of the glass tube or plastic tube and it creates this dip. And you could kind of see in this picture that these ones over here are going to be hydrogen bonding to themselves, that's cohesion, but then if they're hydrogen bonding to the plastic side, that is called adhesion, and it kind of lifts them up and, as they crawl up the side and it creates the dip. Uh, if you've ever gotten your blood taken and you got a little prick in the finger, that is the, and then the, the nurse kind of takes blood with this hollow glass tube, that's capillary action, she just has to dab that plastic tube into that droplet of blood and the cohesive adhesive forces draws it right up the tube without any suction. Same thing here, as the tube gets smaller, capillary action is able to happen more because of surface area. And if you've ever dyed a flower with colored water before, like in these carnations, that is capillary action because of adhesion. And so with plants like those carnations or a tree like this one, water's down here in the roots being absorbed and it has to go way up to the leaves. So how does it go against gravity way up there? Well, there's special tissue inside of plants called vascular tissue and there's two types. There's a type called xylem and a type called phloem. And these are considered water conducting cells or tissue and they're very good at transporting water, the xylem cells are. And if we look at them over here, you could see that between the two water molecules, there's the hydrogen bond, so this is co cohesion, but then as it's sticking to the side of the xylem, this is called adhesion. And they literally kind of tug on one another as they move up the column or this microscopic tube of xylem. This is kind of a better picture that shows a little bit more detail. So there's adhesion between the cell wall and the water molecules, and then there's cohesion between the water, water molecules. So they're able to move up and tug what's below them through cohesion, but then not fall down due to gravity because they're sticking to the sides through adhesion, or that's called capillary action as the water gets drawn upward. Another property of water is that it's a very good solvent. Actually, it's the best in the world. And so because water's polar, when things go into water, like salts, sugars, minerals, and gases, they could easily dissolve. And what that means is that the, the positive and the negative parts of the water molecule find the negative and positive ends of these substances. And so you can see, here's an ACL, which is salt. And salt is made of two ions, the sodium ion and the chlorine ion. Sodium is positive to positively charged and chlorine is negatively charged ion. So what happens is that that salt dissolves. And as it dissolves, you can see it forms these hydration shells. So in this negative chlorine, all the positive hydrogens kind of wrap themselves around it. And over here, the positive sodium ion, all the negative oxygens kind of wrap itself around it. And you can see them better in these pictures over here as well. And so this is literally how substances dissolve in water. Another property of water is that it has high heat capacity. And what this means is, is that it's able to absorb a lot of heat energy without actually changing its temperature very quickly. 
think about boiling water on a stove, it doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes a while for actually that water to start boiling. And that's because of the hydrogen bonds. They absorb this energy, they're all, which is causing them to break, but they're reforming. So it takes a whole lot of energy to actually get those water molecules moving and heating up. So they are very resistant to changes in temperature. And so because of this, they can maintain and stabilize their temperature much, much more efficiently. And that is very useful for organisms maintaining body temperature or even bodies of water like lakes. Think of the Great Lakes that we're by in Lake Erie. That Lake Erie does not change its temperature between the hottest summer days and the coldest winter days very much. It stays within a narrow range of temperature and that's because of hydrogen bonds. And so this is showing a better example of that, like in a lake. So you have the hydrogen bonds between the two water molecules, and you can see all of them over here. So as the sun energy is beating down on them, it disrupts them, but then new ones are constantly being reformed. And so in order to actually break, say, these four hydrogen bonds that are around this one water molecule, it's going to take a larger amount of energy to actually disrupt them and cause an increase of molecular movement to increase the heat of that object. Whereas over here, the sand and the air on the shore, those hydrogen bonds don't exist. So the temperature changes in the air and on the sand much greater. The last property of water I want to talk about is called dissociation, sometimes called ionization. And what that simply means is that water could dissociate or break apart. And when it does so, it forms ions. And so if we look at the picture, and make sure you write this down on your notes, is that if we have the water molecule, so here's the picture of water, here's the name, and here's its formula, what could happen is that sometimes, for one reason or another, it could dissociate and break apart. And when it does, it usually breaks apart by ripping off one of the hydrogen atoms. But when that happens, this hydrogen atom leaves behind its electron. And when it leaves behind its electron, then that means there's an extra negative on this end of it. So what's left is an oxygen and a hydrogen that are still bonded, but there's an extra electron. So it gets a negative charge, and we call that an ion. So this is called a hydroxide ion, OH negative hydroxide ion. And what escaped or got ripped off is just a hydrogen. And if you remember from the picture of water, hydrogen is just one proton and one electron, but it left its electron behind over here. So really, we just have one positive proton, and we call that a hydrogen ion. So water could dissociate into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. And we consider, we're gonna talk about the pH scale in just a second. Water is a neutral substance on the pH scale because when it breaks apart, it has equal amounts of those. And that's what neutral means on the pH scale. So let's look at the pH scale in a little bit more detail. pH stands for parts hydrogen. And we have something called the pH scale that kind of compares the amount of hydrogen ions, H plus, and the amount of hydroxide ions, OH negative, that are in a substance or a solution. And the scale ranges from 0 to 14. And so an example is that our blood is usually between 7.35 and 7.45 on the pH scale, which is just above neutral. And that's actually slightly, just barely on the basic side. And there's a whole lot of different substances that range on this pH scale. And it all deals with seeing what has more hydrogen ions those are what we call acids, but if it has more hydroxide ions, that's what we call a base. And if they're equal, such as water, we say they are neutral and in the middle. And so this is showing a picture of that, that here's in the neutral solution where there's equal amounts of H plus and OH negative, whereas up here we have more hydrogen ions or H pluses, so it's an acid, and down here we have more hydroxide ions, OH negatives, so it is a basic solution. So let's, like, let's look at the pH scale more in detail. So we have the acids from about 0 to 6-ish, and then, or actually anything below 7, and then we have the bases above 7, and we have neutral in the middle. So we talked about neutral being equal amounts of hydrogen and hydroxide ions, which is what it is, and that's at 7. But if it's an acid, it's going to have more hydrogen ions when compared to hydroxide ions. So there's more H plus. 
Anything that's below seven is considered an acid. And the more hydrogen ions you get, the lower the number on the scale. And so the more hydrogen ions you get, the more acidic you get as you move towards zero. Where on the opposite side, bases have more hydroxide ions than hydrogen ions. And so they're going to be anything above seven on the pH scale. And the more hydroxide ions you have, the more basic it becomes. And basic or being a base is also known as alkaline or alkalinity. So being alkaline is also being basic. They're the same term. Now one thing is that when we look at the pH scale, and this shows it in color, which is kind of cool, so we know blue is representing hydroxide ions, red is representing hydrogen ions, and you can see that there's equal amounts at 7. And as we start to get more and more and more and more and more and more and more hydrogen ions, it becomes more and more and more acidic as we head towards zero until it's pure hydrogen ions. And vice versa, as we get more and more and more hydroxide ions, it becomes more basic until we get to 14, which is the most basic and pure hydroxide ions. And so you have a couple different pictures on your paper. So if you looked at this one, what would you say it is? Would you say it's an acid, a base, or would you say it's neutral? And so if you look at the hydrogen versus the hydroxide ions, you could see that there's approximately equal amounts. So this would probably be a neutral substance on the pH scale, probably right around seven. Whereas this one over here, if we look at what we have, we could see that we have a lot more hydroxide ions. So this one would be a base. And when we compare them down here, we could see that we have more hydrogen ions. So this one would be an acid. So here's just another way to look at it. So more hydrogen ions is acidic, more hydroxide ions is alkaline or basic and equal amounts is neutral. But in reality, the thing that we're not getting into is the math behind it. That's saved for more advanced science courses in chemistry and biology. And so if we look at this, it's similar to the previous picture, but now there's these weird numbers on here that are exponential. And I want you to understand that as you go from, say, a pH of 4 to 3, that doesn't mean that you're getting one more hydrogen ion or one more H plus. And a lot of students confuse us and are, don't understand that, well, I have one more, so it must be one more less on the pH scale. It's not. It's actually exponential. It's 10 times more or 10 times less. So as we go from a pH of 4 down to a pH of 3, you actually have 10 times more hydrogen ions. If we go from a pH of 4 to a pH of 5, we actually have 10 times less hydrogen ions instead. And if for you math people out there, this may make a little bit more sense. So if we look at hydrogen ion concentration, and the most hydrogen ions would be the most acidic at 0. Here's the pH scale in the middle. So this would mean 100%. And if we get 10 times less, we're at 1. If we get 10 times less, we're at a 2. 10 times less, etc. And so you get these exponential numbers. And this is where we could get into like logarithms, which you probably never heard about. But uh, that's there's really a lot of math behind it. And then with the hydroxide ion, same thing. It's well, 10 times more, 10 times more, 10 times more, all the way till we get to 100%. So hopefully that makes sense. And the last thing we have to talk about is that pH cannot really move too much and fluctuate in living organisms. It creates a lot of problems if it does, but there's natural variations and this kind of constant dynamic that's happening within all organisms, which means it's constantly changing. And your bodies and your cells have to be able to react or respond to these changes in pH to maintain homeostasis. And so in order for this to happen, your body produces chemicals called buffers. And what these buffers do is that they are able to maintain the pH that's needed for that body part to work. So for example, um, your liver functions best at a 7.2. And your stomach, though, is down at a 1 or a 2 for pH. So when this happens, if these kind of move out of those ranges, that's not good. Something bad is probably going to happen. And so you, you, your body creates buffers that maintain the pH that that body part works the best at. 
Well, I hope that was helpful and I'll see you in the next video.